everyone, and welcome to Functional Fertility, the podcast designed to demystify your hormones, up-level your lifestyle, and supercharge your fertility potential. The process of trying to conceive naturally at a particular time frame for most women shocks their system into like, this is the first time that I have not been able to make something happen by doing the thing. I find that they try to overcompensate for that loss of control on the front end by then starting to uh, put lots of things in place, lots of shoulds in place to control on the back end as a way to really compensate for the loss of control. I'm your host, Dr. Kalia Waddles, and today's episode serves as an exploration in mental and emotional wellness during the fertility journey. Our guest today is psychotherapist, marriage coach, and relationship expert, Carrie Cohen. With over 20 years of clinical experience, Carrie coaches couples to help them heal from the trauma and stress of infertility, loss, and co-parenting difficulties. We're so excited to have you here today. Welcome to the show, Carrie. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Well, I am just really looking forward to kind of tapping into some of your expertise around how we can support patients on their fertility journey when we know that it is an emotional roller coaster. So to get us started, will you just walk us through, you know, at what point do you recommend that couples might engage with a psychotherapist like yourself or even another licensed mental health care provider to help them navigate this experience that's sure to have some ups and downs? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I find that most couples don't really engage a practitioner until things are really bad. And so they are typically spending their time focusing on all of the tangible physical things that they can do in order to increase their chances of conception. And unfortunately, the mental health piece, the emotional health gets pushed into the background until it is forced into the foreground. So most of the couples that I see are already at the point where they're really, really struggling in their relationship. So what I suggest to couples when they have sort of recognized that they are really having a difficult time getting pregnant and perhaps fall into that category of infertility, that it's really good at that point to engage a practitioner to just get yourself started on how to begin to create a roadmap as a couple to navigate probably what is your first challenge as a couple, first of many, but your first one. So once you realize that you are like, okay, so we're going to be now working with our fertility, it would be good as part of our dream team to also have a mental health practitioner on board in some capacity. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Isn't it interesting how we do our labs, we start to work on our nutrition, we do all the things, but you're right. The the mental health aspect often doesn't come in until we're already struggling. And wouldn't that be amazing if we had tools to navigate that and to strengthen our relationships before we were really upset and struggling? Yeah. And, you know, it, it has a way of laying the foundation for mitigating some of the stressors and the impact of the adverse reactions during the process. So if you've already laid in some of the work and you've created a sturdy-ish foundation at the start, once you start hitting those speed bumps or, you know, mountains, you've really got something already to fall back on. Yeah, absolutely. I imagine that in your 20 years of practice, you have kind of curated a great network of other providers who you work with and refer to. Are there other practitioner types that you tend to bring on board as part of the collaborative care team when clients say, I really need support in my mental health? Yeah. So I find that with mental health, it's really good to have um, someone you're doing yoga with Mm because we're really tapping into the spirituality piece and also the grounding and the anchoring. It also supports the nervous system regulation practice that I do with my clients, although I don't, I'm not a yoga practitioner. And I also encourage um, acupuncture as part of that, because not only does that really help with reproductive health and conception, but it also really helps with 
balance and mental health and emotionality. And so those are two augmented services, I would say that commonly I would recommend to my clients while we're working together on mental health. And many of them are already working with either a naturopath or a registered dietitian, and they're already doing some of that. If they're, if they're perhaps not yet at a um, fertility clinic. So they, they oftentimes get the physical bases covered before they're working through deciding, okay, so what do we need for our uh, mental health and our emotional health? Because what happens is, is they get really a one track mind and it's about trying to conceive. But unfortunately, the couple itself gets sort of lost in the mix of that, the longer that process goes on for them. Yeah, maybe you could give some advice. I'm just imagining myself. And if I went to make an appointment with the psychotherapist and I, you know, was trying to be proactive and kind of do preventive medicine, I'm imagining that phone call and what that would look like to say, oh, nothing's really wrong. I just want to, you know, be proactive in my healthcare. As a provider, will you just talk to us about what that looks like and how you would receive that and what we, we should say on the phone? Yeah. So, so let's say it's a couple, cause that's really when, when it comes to fertility, I focus on the couple's health. And so, so the couple calls and they say, um, we have been trying to conceive for about a year now and we are now and naturally, and nothing's been happening. And we are now getting ready to pursue other methods. Um, we started working with an RD or a naturopath. Um, we're, we're getting ready maybe to also work with a fertility clinic. And as part of that, we're, we're really recognizing that it's probably a good idea to also work on our couple because we know that this is going to be a really stressful journey. And so, you know, it is a bit of a misnomer that most of the time when people seek out working with a psychotherapist, that they're, it's very problem oriented. It's very pathology based. And I find that when, when individuals and couples come prophylactically, I've had a lot of couples come, they're like, you know what, we just know that it's going to be really hard to, you know, now start to navigate couplehood. And we just really want someone to help us lay down the groundwork and the foundation so that we know we're building strong from the ground up. And to me, that is just priceless for couples. That's very aligned with how I talk about kind of the medical management piece, you know, being very again, proactive, engaged, involved in our own health. And that extends to our mental health as well. So I really admire that approach. Carrie, I opened up a series of um, kind of a Q&A on my Instagram. I like to collect questions for the experts that we have here on the show. And one of our listeners wrote in and asked this really thoughtful question that I wanted to send your way. She said, how do we balance all of the things that we should, which trying to conceive is full of shoulds, how do we balance all the things that we should be doing while trying to conceive while also staying well in our mental health? Yeah, gosh, it's so hard because when you're on a fertility journey and what happens so often is this tunnel vision, right? So this one track mind and because the process of trying to conceive naturally at a particular time frame for most women shocks their system into like, this is the first time that I have not been able to make something happen by doing the thing. Um, that, that then I find that they try to overcompensate for that loss of control on the front end by then starting to uh, put lots of things in place, lots of shoulds in place to control on the back end as a way to really compensate for the loss of control. And so I find that when individuals, when women and couples jointly can start to think about, okay, so how do we begin to create a roadmap? And I think that, that here's where also, if you're in a support group or you're working with someone, that you really can begin to create a roadmap of, okay, so what are all the things that we want to do, right? It's much easier to do things that we want to do than, than things that we should do or need to do. So I always say across the board with whatever kind of client I'm working with, it's like, if you can get yourself into the category of like, I want to do this rather than I should be doing this, then you can actually get behind it and stand behind it and it will stick. And so I like to sort of create a list of what are all the wants and what are all the shoulds. 
and how many of those shoulds can move into the want category. And the ones that we can move into the want category, we really start to focus on. And so, and then begin to, um, so what we want to do is if we're sort of thinking about a scale and we have um, two sides of that scale, we actually want the wants to start to weigh heavier than the shoulds, because we don't want to be in a position where we are sort of compromising what's really meaningful and valuable and important to us by doing all the things that we think we should be doing, because then when it doesn't work out that way, then we're sort of at a loss of like, okay, well, I did all the things that I should be doing and it didn't work. And so I really encourage couples to pick a few things that they really want to do. So whether that's um, nurturing their couple as part of like a mental health piece, um, changing, uh, making some changes to how they eat in the household, maybe um, adding in more foods that they know will support her hormone health. And then he starts to, if whoever's doing the cooking is preparing that. And I find that if they can really come up with a few things that they really want to do, they can dedicate their time. Most of the other things actually will just fall into place organically or are not actually necessary. That is such a lovely approach. And I'm just thinking about how that would feel to make that list and to be able to release some of the shoulds I know when I was going through my own fertility journey, I really struggled with this concept of control and felt like I was losing control. And you just touched on that piece. And for me, it brought up all of these questions about, should I be trying to take back control or should I be trying to release the control? How does that conversation go with your clients when they feel like they're just spiraling? And like you said it so perfectly of, I did the thing. So why is the outcome not what I would expect? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for many women like yourself and myself included, uh, it's the first time that one is faced with not being able to control the outcome. And so when we can't control the outcome of something or we can't control something we think we should be able to control, right, that we then start looking for other things to start to control in order to mitigate that feeling of disempowerment and loss and sort of ineffectiveness, right? Unproductiveness. And so I think that when we can begin to contextualize that as a, like a compensatory response, like a response to start to compensate for something else, really contextualize it and understand it and put it in its place, then we can make a more like conscious or active decision, like, okay, so what is the function of this behavior? Am I doing it because I'm trying to compensate for this loss over here? Or am I doing it because it truly would help me? So I'm really big on understanding the function of behaviors that serve us and don't serve us. And then really starting to reframe those that have a function that ultimately don't serve us. They're compensating for something, they're defensive, they're protective, and things like that. It's so interesting. I don't know why I've never thought about this, but how when you start to lose control in your fertility specifically, you start to hyper fixate on control in other areas of your life. And I certainly relate to that. Like I've got all these air filters, like let me hyper manage all of the air quality in my whole house and what the temperature is in my bedroom and my sleeping environment and how dark it is. And I mean, you really do start to look for how you can control every aspect, but it's so it's actually relieving to hear you talk about that. And I'm sure that there's listeners who recognize that behavior in themselves and wow. Okay. That's kind of a, a mm -hmm. typical behavior that you might see. So um, thank you for kind of normalizing that for all of us who've been there along, along the same train of thought earlier this year, you posted about some lifestyle change for overcoming infertility. And I loved your approach because when I talk about lifestyle change, it's very much, you know, nutrition and exercise and sleep, but you had a different approach that was more focused on, it was really holistic. How can really, we really support our mental, emotional, spiritual wellness from the ground up, as you said, Will you share some of your tried and true lifestyle strategies? Yeah. So, um, so for me, it's really, I'm, I'm really big on clients, you know, supporting their, uh, reproductive health through supporting their physical health with movement and nutrition and things like that. Um, and also I would say that there's lots of other things that we could do for our mindset or our psyche. And so I am really big on, helping clients start to create some routines or rituals that can be very emotionally anchoring. So for example, 
that might mean getting up 10 minutes earlier before everyone else in the house gets up so that you have your own quiet time to sit and drink your coffee or your tea and read about 10 pages from a mindset book. And I'm I am always giving suggestions of spiritual mindset books for clients, like books that really nourish your soul. They're not they're not very heady. They're not theoretical. You're not reading about, you know, your diet and how to conceive and what are the best. It's really more to just nourish your spirit and your soul. So I like to help people create routines. And so one of those would be anchoring in with, let's just say a mindset book. I'm not remembering that post right now because gosh, there's been probably hundred of them since then. But I would say that the other types of lifestyle shifts that I really encourage clients to make is beginning to add in some more play and some more fun. So I do this a lot with couples in general, but if we think about with couples on a fertility journey, boy, it is all work, no play, right? There, like there is no time to waste because my clock is ticking. And so it's all work, no play. So I encourage couples and we sort of create a structure for how to begin to incorporate some play, some levity, some lightness, some laughter, because the reality is, is that's often gone too, because this dark cloud of infertility is weighing heavily on them. So we then start to create some opportunities. You know, I'm always, I'm always having clients make lists. So it's like, you know, I have them do the work and then they bring it back to me. And then we start to map out the plan. So starting to do things that are fun because I hear a lot of husbands talk about how they like, they just can't get their wives to laugh anymore. They, their wives don't laugh. They don't smile at them. They crack jokes and their wives are just sitting there, you know, very sober looking. And I find that going through a fertility journey is a very sobering experience, especially for women can be for men too, but really it is for women. Absolutely. That's the perfect lead into my next set of questions for you because I know that you're a relationship expert and you create a lot of content about strengthening our marriages, but also our relationships relationships in general. And I think that there are several relationships that can be affected on our fertility journey, right? Our relationship with ourself, with our romantic partners, with our friends, with our social circle. But you touched on this piece about cultivating lightheartedness and fun in our marriage when we're going through a fertility journey. You, you mentioned this a little bit, but how, will you talk us through some differences in how you see men and women navigating the fertility journey, but especially when there's infertility? Mm, yeah. So, you know, it's, there's, there's some general ways that men versus women go through this. So I'll speak generally, recognizing that there are exceptions, of course. Um, so generally speaking, I would say in my experience with most of the couples I've worked with, and even in my own personal experience, is that um, men are fairly relaxed about it. Uh, many men can actually feel good with not ever having a kid because they have their wife. Like they would not want to sacrifice their wife or their partner in order to have a child. Mm -hmm. And so I am not sure that as many women actually would feel that way because I think that women are just inherently and innately different than men. We're all wired differently. And for those women who like have always known they wanted to be a mom, myself included, I would have gone to the ends of the earth to have a child. And so, but I don't think my husband wouldn't, would have, he would have, he would have gone along with whatever I wanted to do if I wanted to keep going. But generally speaking, women are way more high strung. They're way more anxious about it because there's something very primitive and visceral about becoming a mother for those who want to become a mother, that is. Whereas for men, I, I, I would say it's, it's not inherently visceral and primitive for them. So they can actually be a lot more relaxed on the journey, which can be good and bad. So on the one hand, it can be bad because women feel like, what, you don't care. This isn't as important to you. You're just skating along. It's all happening in my body. You seem like you're fine. You don't understand me. And there can be a dis big disconnect. But actually, we can use that as an asset in the couple. Because if he's more grounded and he's less anxious, 
then we want to be able to use him to help ground her and regulate her so she can sort of borrow or feed off of some of his energy. But the couple has to agree to that. There has to be a negotiation that happens where it's not misinterpreted as him just being laissez-faire or lackadaisical. It's him really serving as the grounding, stable presence while she's going like this. Because gosh, we don't want both doing that roller coaster, right? It's not, it's not going to be good for reproductive health. It's not going to be good for mental health. It's not good for physical health. So I think that some of those are important factors that couples really need to have conversations about though. Like these things need to be talked about. Yeah. Well, I guess that's why it's so helpful to have you or someone like you on the care team so we can bring all these things to the surface. Now, something that's extremely heartbreaking to me that I've seen you post about is when couples are going through infertility, we see higher rates of divorce. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's because of this discordance in how we're navigating the journey? It's probably financial stress. I mean, what are some of the reasons that are coming up in your practice when couples decide we can't do this anymore? Yeah. So, so first I think that, um, many couples believe that all their problems will be solved once they have a baby. Now, if, if the issues they're facing did not predate infertility, and if the fertility journey is not that long, that's highly, highly probable that they will feel great once their baby comes, highly probable. But if there were issues that predated the fertility journey and or if they if their dynamic created destruction to their foundation while they're on the fertility journey, then the baby is not going to solve all the problems because they're going to actually have to work through those other issues. And so I find that um, when when couples are at that place where the longer they're on this journey, so uh, there might be more disagreement about next steps. So I've had couples where they're on IVF round five and he's saying like, I can't do this anymore. I can't watch you. You're like a shell of a human. And she is like dead set. Like, I'm just going to keep doing it until, you know, we get pregnant. And, and so, and that, that creates sort of one of the first, like, I don't, you know, philosophical disconnects in that couple. So there's some disconnects in couples that really can be destructive, like, a, like that unresolvable disconnects that is. So have kids or not have kids? How do we spend our money? What do our finances look like? What does our co-parenting look like? Religion. Like there are some fundamental philosophical differences that if couples cannot resolve, then they're only going to grow farther apart and it is going to eat away at the glue that holds them together. And what I find is when couples are not on the same page about the journey and what the next steps are and what their limits are and where do we stop, then um, they could just really start to grow apart. And that's one, I would say one of the top contributing factors to divorce. Well, you just made quite the strong case for having someone, a psychotherapist or a family counselor, someone mm -hmm. on board at the beginning of your fertility journey so that you can talk about all of these pieces before you're in it, in the thick of it. Mm -hmm. I think that's really powerful. Obviously, communication is key, and you've highlighted many reasons why that's true. And sometimes when I'm working with couples, they come to me and you know, you get really mechanized and you get the positive ovulation predictor kit and your timing sex around when the time in the month is right. And it just feels it's lacking spontaneity. It's lacking that fun and lightheartedness. How do you help patients reconnect to the fun and light parts of their relationship when ultimately their goal is to get pregnant and they do need to do some timing and some tracking? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I think that what we do is we balance that out by um, incorporating other other experiences. So you know we don't we don't take away from that, right? They're still sort of tracking and they're doing what they're doing and they're planning. But in addition to that, I always encourage couples to create other opportunities to go on dates. And whatever that date looks like, it doesn't matter where they go or what they do. The sole purpose of the date is to really just nourish the friendship and the connection and the attachment, the reasons why they got together. 
um, which was which was before they were even talking about having kids, generally speaking. So beginning to nourish that because that is the very thing that really starts to move to the back burner. And so I think about the relationship as, you know, there's sort of two sides of the relationship. We have the business side on one side and we have the personal side on the other. And when couples are navigating something really difficult, like infertility, they tend to become all business. It's all about the logistics, the timing, the schedule, the finances, the plans, all of that. And that's really no fun. Right. And so, so I really help couples think about, okay, there's a whole nother, well, first of all, you're multifaceted, but if we're just thinking about two sides, we're completely neglecting the personal side of the relationship, which is the friendship, the love, the connection, the attachment, um, the doing things together that you love doing, the play, all of that. So we start to create um, opportunities for starting to nurture that part of the relationship by, you know, I always say, I like them to have two dates a week. One is for the business, one's to address all the business, and one is to address the personal. Go on a coffee date, 30, 45 minutes, bring your questions, bring your comments, address all the business, compartmentalize it. Like healthy compartmentalizing is very important. And then go on your date to nourish your bond and your friendship. No talk about business, no talk about kids, no talk about fertility, none of that. You're just there to fill your cups. And then, you know, whatever is fluid in between there, if something acute is going on, then that's a different story. But I think that this is one of those things where couples don't realize, myself included, historically, that you have to be really intentional and active to, to make these things happen in your relationship. They don't just happen organically. And so here's where I think it's like, well, couples like, well, we didn't realize we should have done that. Well, well, no, you did. of course you didn't realize you should have done that. Like that's not where your mind was. And so here's where I think having people, even if whether you're in a support group or you're working with someone is having people to say, here are all the things that we did that were really helpful. It's like, wow, I didn't even think that we needed to do that because it's oftentimes we don't realize it until we're sort of past that point already. Well, I think everything you're describing to really fortify those connections helps us when we have to have difficult conversations. Mm -hmm. And we had a listener write in and she asked, how do I talk to my partner about getting on board with lifestyle change? And I think we can loop this back to what you were saying before of sometimes each member of a couple navigates the journey differently. One might be more relaxed, one might be more hypervigilant. And so a, a pattern that I see is sometimes, um, the female partner who's actively going through treatment is like doing all the things and maybe her partner isn't ready to embrace some of those more drastic lifestyle changes yet. So how can they have that conversation in a way that doesn't make anyone feel defensive and it's just supportive on both ends? Yeah. So, okay. So first things first, we can always, we can only go as fast as the slowest person. So if she's like full throttle level 10, I'm doing all the things. And he's like, you know what? I'm at a three. The, the painful reality of that is that we have to operate at a three right now until he's ready to move a little bit faster. But so, so what we need to do is we need to meet the partner who's moving slower where they are. So when I'm working with a couple, and one is, you know, at step three, one is at step 10. I work really hard to get the partner at step 10 to meet the partner at step three and start the conversation there. And then together, you jointly start to move forward because what will happen is, is she'll feel like she's always dragging him always dragging him and feel incredibly resentful that she's doing all the things and he's not doing any of the things. And so we, we actually have to slow down before we could speed up. So I would say you open that dialogue and you begin to think about, okay, so let's look at here are all the things we could be doing, right? In terms of like checking our temperatures, wearing boxers and not briefs, eating these foods, avoiding these foods, not, act, not doing hit exercise. Like here are all the things we could be doing, right? And I would actually get that list from someone, uh, a trusted person, not from Google either. And so here are all the things we could be doing. And to me, in marriage, everything is a negotiation. So those two really need to have a negotiation. Okay, so what are we willing to both be on board with? 
What can you do? What are you willing to do? And it's really important that we respect people's limits. It could be really hard when we really want something in a marriage and, and it feels life and death. And our partner's like, I just, I really just can't do that right now. That we really have to respect their boundaries around that. And I know how difficult that is. But if we slow down and we sort of meet them where they are, we have a much better chance of them actually then deciding to join us and walk with us forward where we're going rather than us pulling them and tugging them along. It sounds to me like the should list and the want list that you talked about. I mean, that really applies to all members of the couple. And I was really thinking about that as you were talking of, okay, well, what's reasonable for you? What do you want to do? And I think that's probably key in that sustainable behavior change for both people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah. for sure. You know, it's really interesting. So I'm 49, I'm perimenopausal, and I've been sort of looking at my, um, like what my options are in terms of how I take care of my body and eat and, and, um, naturally manage the menopausal symptoms. And so I've read lots of things, everything from intermittent fasting to intuitive eating. And so I've been trying to go this intuitive, this intermittent fasting way. I've never been an intermittent faster. I hate restriction. It like, it's like deep in my soul. I hate restriction. It goes all the way back to like my early childhood. I do not like deprivation at all. And so I've been reading these books and I've been thinking about it. And then I, yesterday, literally, I found this woman who's more of an intuitive eater for menopause. And I was like, that's what I want to do. Like that feels so good. So it's like, we can force ourselves to do things that we think we should do and go kicking and screaming all along the way. And it's not going to be successful until we find something that feels really congruent with what we want and who we are and how we are, just how our mind is organized. And I think that's really, really important for the individual part of the couple and the couple as a, a joint unit. Yeah. Can't be walking around with internal conflict all the time. That's not helpful. (laughs) Exactly. You're talking my language now. <laughs> even even outside of our um, romantic relationships or our intended co-parent, we have all these other relationships that exist, our friendships, our social circle, our coworkers. And sometimes I feel, and I have felt like this personally, that when we're struggling with our fertility, we start to disengage from our social networks because we don't want people to ask about it. We don't want to talk about it. Maybe we're not feeling energized or motivated. We want to avoid triggers that are out there in the world. Do you have any advice for how we can maintain our relationships, but still honor those boundaries and and what feels natural for us in terms of engaging with the outside world? Yeah. You know, it's so hard. Um, there, when, when women are going through infertility, it, it can also feel like, I mean, actually depression is, is there's a high comorbidity with infertility and depression. And so, So if we think about depression, um, if we just think about the state of depression, not even clinical depression, the state of depression, our energy is low. um, We're not getting a lot of pleasure in things that used to bring us pleasure. Um, We are um, kind of just more avoidant. And and so it's a very similar feeling that women going through infertility have. So what I say to people in that situation is, you know what, you really just need to give yourself grace. So pick a couple of things that you can do in a day or in a week, whatever those might be. Um, and just do a couple of things. Like if you have a list of 25 things, just pick a couple of things. If you don't feel like talking on the phone, but you want to stay connected to your friends, send them a text. All good friends will understand. Like they will absolutely understand. And those who don't, you know, then then you sort of weed out those who are are not really congruent with what, what it is that you need in your life. And so, but I do think it's important to create a little bit of balance. And I don't mean 50-50 balance, but I mean not being a hundred percent withdrawn and reclusive during this process. But let's say, I don't know, 80-20 maybe, if if you can, if you can muster up 20% of engagement. And 80% allow yourself to sort of just be, you know, nesting and and taking care of yourself in your home. But I do think that we need grace during this time. Um, And and frankly, the the little bit of engagement with people, A, it keeps us connected, but B, it's good for our mood. It's a mood booster, you know, it's a serotonin booster. And I think that those things are important. 
Yeah. I've thought about this before when I've talked to patients, it's like, listen, maybe it's a good idea to still go to your book club because, you know, you can have something you talk about, you have your friends, you don't need to go to someone's baby shower if you're not feeling it right. But still having those outlets for connecting with your circle. And it sounds harsh, but I've thought this so many times that, you know, if, if you're struggling with your fertility and a friend invites you to their baby's first birthday or their baby shower. And and you reach out and say, Hey, I just don't have the emotional bandwidth to do this right now. And they're upset. That's kind of a natural filtration process that maybe that person isn't supporting your best interests right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Mm. Well, uh, we have another question that came in from one of our listeners. And I think Many of us are really working through how do we remain positive or motivated when it seems like our journey just takes one turn after another or we experience loss. She said, how do we focus our minds on positivity after experiencing something like pregnancy loss? Do you have some advice for us? Yeah. So, you know, First things first, which is that the pregnancy loss needs to be grieved. And if we think about the process of grieving and, you know, although it's not linear, but grieving is, um, um, you know, it's denial, anger, depression, bargaining, acceptance, and hope. So first of all, we need to allow ourselves to go through all of those stages, like denial. Like I, I cannot believe it's, it's, it's like, I cannot, it's more of a conscious denial. Usually like, I cannot believe this is happening to me you know, the anger, which is so obvious, the bargaining, oh my gosh, was it that piece of deli meat I ate? If only I wouldn't have eaten that deli meat or that sushi last week, or, you know, I I lifted something, we had sex, whatever it might be. Um, uh, Depression is obvious, the sadness. I mean, that's the sadness part. But in the end, the place where we have to really come to is an acceptance of what is, what the reality is, and a hopefulness about our future, whatever our future is. And so I think that first things, women, men, and couples, because there's three grieving process happening. There's hers, there's his, and then there's the couples. Okay. So when you're pregnant, so I had a ectopic pregnancy and it was fairly early. It was about, um, I would say about seven weeks in, but boy, did I have everything planned out already in those seven weeks? Cause we've been trying for a while. So, so it's, it's the loss of the pregnancy. It's the loss of what you thought was going to be. It's the loss of your dreams, your hopes. And and it's obviously very crushing. And so I think that it's really important that men, women, and couples allow themselves the space and the patience to really go through and grieve. And a big thing for that is that oftentimes I find that men and women are on a different page with that largely because a it's the woman's body she's the one experienced it she's more connected because it's the baby started growing in her body but also men don't really feel like there's a space for them to grieve because they're really they're being supportive for their wives men are also generally like to fix things and there's also there's a still a very strong boy code that doesn't end when you become an adult where they you know they have to be strong and they have to be strong for their wives and so i think that um i would say we don't necessarily need to focus on positivity, but really more so having hope. And hope for me, here's where I get, here's where, here's where this is the work that I do for myself is really, I work really intentionally on this Buddhist concept of a detaching from the outcome. And, um, and it, it's, it can sound a little bit flippant, but, but the reality is, is when it's like, it's, it's a book that I come back to again and again. So when I said, I, you know, I, encourage people to take 10 minutes to read something spiritual. It's a practice that I do myself. And so thinking about this idea of really detaching from the outcome and the way we detach from the outcome is by really just having self-trust. And I really cultivate that with my clients is really having self-trust. And that's, you know, it's a whole nother discussion. It's a whole nother process. But when we really can trust ourselves and we trust that like, I can do this, I can get through this regardless of what happens. I know I can get through it because I've done hard things before, not this hard thing, but other hard things. So I think that I would reframe this idea of positivity because I don't think that's necessary. And I'm not even sure that how, if it would be real positivity, but I would focus it more on hope and having hope and cultivating hope and doing things that bring you more hope. That feels really good to me, focusing on hope. And I also, it really struck me when you talked about the different 
depths and different uh, the spectrum of grieving. And I know that um, when I had my second miscarriage and it was very early, but I had planned out what that baby was going to be for Halloween. I had planned out our Christmas photos, you know, and my husband, who is extremely supportive, he was genuinely shocked that my mind had gone there already. Like you were pregnant for two seconds and you, I had, but I had visualized this child's entire life, you know? And so I think it's really helpful that we normalize that when you lose a pregnancy, it's not just that the pregnancy test turns negative. It's all these ideas and hopes and dreams that you had already had. Um, and just being really gentle and showing ourselves grace about that. I think focusing on hope that feels really empowering and lovely to me, uh, continuing along after we've had loss, sometimes hopefully we get pregnant again and now we have this pregnancy. But I think that in the back of our mind, there's this twinge of anxiety of, will I lose this baby again? And you have all of these memories. Will you share some advice that you have to kind of quell that worrying when you have a pregnancy after loss? Yeah. You know, it's really hard because it doesn't take much to condition our mind to believe something, unfortunately. So it can take one really powerful experience and, and it's sort of locked into our subconscious. And now we are conditioned to believe that just because that happened to me before, it's going to happen again. Even though we can talk to our conscious mind with all of the cognitive thoughts, like these pregnancies, they're mutually exclusive. They're not related. One has nothing to do with the other. Uh, you know, you did different things this time. And the last time, it doesn't even matter because none of it's really conscious. It's really what's happening in our subconscious mind. And so And when there is a traumatic experience, and for most women, I would say, you know, trauma is in the eye of the beholder. So what's traumatic to me isn't traumatic to the next person. But generally speaking, for many women, there's at least an acute traumatic response to that. And so so there's then all of these um, associative reminders to it, right? Like where we were, when it happened, and how far along we were, and what we ate that day, and all of that. And so I think that the biggest thing for women to do is to really begin to like stay present and start to really focus in the moment what they are doing. And here's where it's another sort of Buddhist concept, which I I really rely on um, these concepts is that when we really start to stay mindful of the moment and just focus on the one foot in front of the other, and we can use this when we're going through any challenge. Okay. It's, it's not about the moment five minutes ago, and it's not about the moment in 10 minutes. It's about this very moment. And in this very moment, my body feels good. My body feels grounded. My stomach feels good. My mind feels good. I feel really contained. It's really, really, and this is a practice that I'm describing it to you intellectually, but it is of course not an intellectual process. It's an embodied process. And it's one that we have to do. And I still, I, you know, I, I do it again and again. I have a family member who's going through an an illness right now and I'm really close to them and it's very hard. And and I'm having to call in all these practices like, okay, good, like right in this moment, like everything is good and really savoring the in this moment, everything is good and not letting the mind continue to wander to when it's not going to be good, if it's not going to be good. And of course, most women feel better once they pass that point where they um, miscarried before. So if you could sort of just like, sit tight until that point, most women then they, a lot of times that feeling starts to dissipate. I'm picturing so many different scenarios in which that in this moment, everything is good. I am safe. I feel good. I I could apply that to so many different situations in life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, it's a beautiful, like principle, like beautiful guiding principle and practice. I'll be calling upon that one (laughs) regularly. (laughs) Carrie, I'm really interested in your utilization of hypnotherapy as you're working with couples and fertility patients. I think that modality is probably new to many of our listeners. Will you just tell us a little bit about what a hypnotherapy session looks like and what are some of the benefits for your patients who are going through fertility treatment? Yeah. So I love hypnotherapy. It is really powerful. It packs a punch. It's quick you get in there and you get to the heart of things. So I find actually that it's really so few things. Uh, One is um, it's really good for 
calming, grounding, relaxation, really it, it, for people who can't meditate, it becomes, a, it can become a meditative process because I provide a, um, an installation audio that they listen to for about a month after, which is about 15 minutes long. And it puts them in a, you know, a, a hypno state, which is basically a, you know, a trance like meditative state. So it's good for that. But more importantly, it's really good for people who have, um, beliefs that are getting in the way or mental blocks. So that woman who's like, I am convinced that I am not going to be able to hold a baby. Like, we don't want to be convinced of that, right? We don't want, I'm not gonna be able to hold a pregnancy rather. We don't want to be convinced of that. So I find it's really, really good for that. So when I do a session like that, it takes up to two hours and I walk the client through. Um, we, we do some pre-work where we go through like, okay, so what is, what are we going to focus on? What's the target? And let's just say we're going to focus on, I don't believe that I'm ever going to be able to carry a baby. And then we start to go through um, sort of what, what triggers that? What are the triggers that sort of activate that thought? What does it look like? What does it feel like? Where do you feel it in your body? It's a very um, like mind body connected approach, which is also why I really love it. And then we sort of start to paint the picture. What do you like? What do you want to believe? What do you want to feel? What do you want things to look like? And so we create that picture and then we go into, then I do a rapid induction, which takes about five minutes. And again, it's, it's just a mild trance-like state. People are very relaxed, but what's happening is, is we have access to the subconscious mind. And so when I was doing purely talk therapy, it would take a lot to get access to the subconscious mind because it's really hard for people to get into that space. So this, you really activate it very quickly. So when they're in a trance-like state, I then walk them through um, sort of re a regression basically. And I, and I have their mind go to places through the techniques I use in order to go to places that are connected to this belief that they're holding. And ultimately what we do is we go to the source of the belief. We start at the top with the belief. We dig all the way down. We go to the source of the belief. We clean it out. We replace that belief with a new narrative actually, which is the picture they painted for me before the session. And then we install it through the repetition. It's really a subconscious reprogramming. So it's great for people who have these like really rigid, long standing beliefs or short standing because they've gotten themselves convinced of something during their fertility journey. And um, it's a it's a a big paradigm shift internal. That sounds incredible. Is this something you can do virtually? The client doesn't have to be in your office. Well, yeah, I do it virtually. I only yeah. work virtually. So yes, I do it virtually. So I've you know I've done it with men, women. I've done it with all sorts of issues, not just fertility issues. It's very powerful. And what happens is it opens up some other things for people. And then what we do is about a month or six weeks later, we'll go back in, we'll get the residual stuff and then we clean it out. And because really, you know, I am not a huge, I, I do give clients a lot of tips and strategies and tools, but if our mind can't buy into it, it's not going to be useful. It's really challenging those deeply held beliefs that aren't serving us. It sounds like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. Well, Carrie, I love to close our episodes with something heart-centered that our listeners can take away. And so my final question for you is, if you could go back to when you were first trying to conceive, what is a piece of advice that you would give yourself? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I wished I would have had the self-trust then mm -hmm. that I have now trusting that one way or another, I will have an outcome that I can live with. And so I didn't believe that then. It was really, really hard. And so I wish I could have. And I think that when women are going through this, if they can really do all of the other ancillary self-trust work and come to this place that one way or another, I will have an outcome that I can live with that that's really comforting because really what people are thinking when they're on this journey is that they're going to get an outcome that they can't live with. Wow. That is really, really, really powerful and the perfect place to close. Carrie, thank you so much for all of your work in the fertility space and for sharing your insights with us today. It's just been a pleasure to get to know you. I also want to thank all of our listeners for tuning in and a big thank you to Paola Martini, our show's producer. We look forward to seeing you all again next time. Thanks everyone. Thank you. 
Did you love this episode and want to hear more? Head over to drkaliawaddles.com slash podcast where you can find more episodes on all things fertility.